Here reading from Arena, the Stephen King book, Bizarre and Bad Dreams. It's a collection of a bunch of short stories, so this short story is called Premium Harmony. They've been married for 10 years, and for a long time everything was okay. Swell, but now they argue. Now they argue quite a lot. It's really all the same argument. It has circulatory. It is, Ray sometimes thinks, like a dog track. When they argue, they're like greyhounds chasing the mechanical rabbit. You go past the same scenery time after time, but you don't see the landscape. You see the rabbit. He thinks it might be different. He thinks it might be different if they had kids. But she couldn't have kids. They finally got tested, and that's what the doctor said. It was her problem, something in her. A year or so after that, he bought her a dog, a Jack Russell named Business. Mary would spell it out for people who asked. B-I-Z-N-E-Z-Z. -Z -Z. She wanted everyone to know the joke. She loved that dog, but now they argue anyway. They're going to Walmart for grass seed. They've decided to sell the house. They can't afford to keep it. But Mary says they won't get far unless they do something about the plumbing and make the lawn nice. She says those bald patches make it look shanty Irish. It's been a hot summer with no rain to speak of. Ray tells her grass seed won't grow in the lawn without rain, no matter how good the grass seed is. He said they should wait. Then another year goes by and we're still there, she says. We can't wait another year, Ray. We'll be bankrupt. When she talks, Biz looks at her from his place in the back seat. Sometimes he looks at Ray when Ray talks, but not always. Mostly he looks at Mary. What do you think, he says. Is it going to rain? So do you have to worry about going bankrupt? We're in this together unless you forgot, she says. The driving through Castle Rock now. It's pretty dead. What Ray calls the economy has disappeared from this part of Maine. The Walmart is on the other side of town, near the high, high school where Ray is a janitor. The Walmart has its own spotlight. People joke about it. Penny wise and pound foolish, she says. You ever hear that one? A million times from you. He grunts. He can see the dog in the rearview mirror watching her. Sometimes he hates the way Biz does that. It comes to him that neither of them knows what they are talking about. It's a depressing thought. And pull in at the quick pick, she says. I want to get a kickball for Tally's birthday. Tally is her brother's little girl. Ray supposes that makes her his niece, although he's not quite sure that's right since all the blood is on Mary's side. They have balls at Walmart, Ray says, and everything's cheaper at Wally World. The one at quick pick are purple. Purple's her favorite color. I can't be sure there'll be a purple at Walmart. If there ain't, we'll stop at the quick pick on the way back. He feels like a great weight is pressing down on his head. She'll get her way. She always does on things like this. Marriage is like a football game, and he's quarterbacking the underdog team. He has to pick his spots, make short passes. It'll be on the wrong side coming back, she says, if they were caught in a torrent of city traffic instead of rolling through an almost deserted little town where most of the stores are for sale. I'll just dash in and get the ball and dash right back out. At 200 pounds, Ray thinks, your dashing days are over, honey. They're only 99 cents, she says. Don't be such a pinch penny. Don't be so pound foolish, he thinks, but what he says is, buy me a pack of smokes while you're in there, I'm out. If you quit, we'd have extra $40 a week. He saves up and pays a friend in South Carolina to ship him a dozen cartons at a time. They're $20 a carton cheaper in South Carolina. That's a lot of money, even in this day and age. It's not like he doesn't try to economize. He has told her this before, and will again, but what's the point? In one ear, out the other. Nothing to slow down what he says in the middle. I used to smoke two packs a day, he says. Now I smoke less than a half a pack. Actually, more days he smokes more. She knows it, and Ray knows she knows it. That's marriage after a while. That weight on his head gets a little heavier. Also, he can see Biz still looking at her. He feeds the damn thing. He makes the money that pays for the food. But it's her he's looking at. And Jack Russells are supposed to be smart. He turned into the quick pick. You ought to buy them on Indian Island if you got to have them, she says. They haven't sold tax-free smokes on the res for ten years, he says. I've told you that, too. You don't listen. He pulls past the gas pumps and parks beside the store. There's no shade. The sun is directly overhead. The car's air conditioner only works a little bit. They are both swearing in the back seat. Biz is panting and makes him look like he's grinning. Well, you ought to quit, Mary says. And you ought to quit those little Debbies, he says. He doesn't want to say this. He knows how sensitive she is about her weight, but out it comes. He can't hold it back. It's a mystery. I ain't had one in a year, she says. Mary, the box is on the top shelf, a 24-pack, behind a flower. Were you snooping, she cries. A rush is rising in her cheeks, and he sees how she looks when she's, she is still beautiful. 
Good looking anyway. Everyone says she was good looking, even his mother who didn't like her otherwise. I was looking for the bottle opener, he says. I had a bottle of cream soda, the kind with old-fashioned cap. Looking for a bottle opener on the top shelf at a goddamn cupboard? Go in and get the ball, he says, and get me some smokes. Be a sport. Can't you wait until we get home? Can't you ever wait that long? Says you can get the cheap ones, he says. The off-brand, Premium Harmony, they're called. They taste like old, stale cow shit, but all right. If she'll only shut up about it, it's too hot to argue. Where are you going to smoke anyway? In the car, I suppose, so I'll have to breathe it? I'll open the window. I always do. I'll get the ball, then I'll come back. If you feel like you have to spend $4.50 to poison your lungs, you can go in. I'll sit with the baby. Ray hates it when she calls Biz the baby. He's a dog, and he may be as bright as Mary likes to boast, but he still shits outside and licks his balls what used to be. Buy a few Twinkies while you're at it, he tells her, and maybe they're having a special on Ho-Ho's. Yours is so mean, she says. She gets out of the car and slams the door. He's parked too close to the concrete cube of buildings, and she has to saddle up until the trunk of the car, and he knows that she's looking at her, seeing how she's now so big she has to sidle. He knows she thinks he parked close to the building on purpose to make her sidle, and maybe he did. He wants a cigarette. Well, Biz, old buddy, it's just you and me. Biz lies on the back seat and closes his eyes. He may get up on his back paws and shuffle around for a few seconds when Mary puts on a record and tells him to dance. And if she tells him in a jolly voice that he's a bad boy, he may go into the corner and sit facing the wall, but he still shits outside. The time goes by and she doesn't come out. Ray opens the glove apartment. He paws through the rat's nest of papers looking for some cigarettes. He might have forgotten, but there aren't any. He does find a host of snowball still in its wrapper. He pokes it. It's stiff as a corpse. It's got to be a thousand years old, maybe older. Maybe it came over on the ark. Everyone has his poison, he says. He unwraps the snowball and tosses it into the back seat. Want this, Biz? Go ahead, knock yourself out. Biz snarks the snowball in two bites, then he sets to working, licking up bits of coconut off the seat. Mary would have a shit fit, but Mary's not here. Ray looks at the gas gauge and sees it's down the half. He can turn off the motor and unroll the windows, but then he'd really bake. Sitting here in the sun, waiting for her to buy a purple plastic kickball for 99 cents when he knows they can get one for 79 cents at Walmart. Only that one might be yellow. Or red. Not good enough for Tally. Only purple for the princess. He sits there and Mary doesn't come back. Christ on a pony, he says. Cold air traces over his face. He thinks again about turning off the engine, saving some gas, then thinks, fuck it. She won't bring him to smokes either. Not even the cheap off-brand. This he knows. He had to make that crack about those little Debbies. He sees a young woman in the rearview mirror. She's jogging towards the car. She's even heavier than Mary. Great big tits shuffle back and forth under her blue smock. Biz sees her coming and starts to bark. Ray unrolls the window. Is your wife a blonde-haired woman? She puffs the words. A blonde-haired woman wearing sneakers? Her face shines with sweat. Yes, she, she's wanted a ball for our niece. Well, something's wrong with her. She fell out. She's unconscious. Mr. Gosh said he thinks she may have had a heart attack. He called 911. You better come. Ray locks the car and follows her into the store. It's cold inside after the car. Mary is laying on the floor with her legs spread and her arms at her side. She's next to a wire cylinder full of kickballs. The sign over the wire cylinder says, Hot fun in the summertime. Her eyes are closed. She might be sleeping there on the aluminum floor. Three people are standing over her. There's one dark-skinned man in khaki pants and, and white shirt. A name tag on the pocket of his shirt says, Mr. Gosh Manager. The other two are customers. One is a thin old man without much hair. He is in his 70s at least. The other is a fat woman. She's fatter than Mary. Fatter than the girl in the blue smock too. Ray thinks by right she's the one who should be laying on the floor. Sir, are you this lady's husband? Mr. Gosh asked. Yes, Ray says. That doesn't seem to be enough. I sure am. I'm sorry to say, but I think she might be dead, Mr. Gosh says. I gave the artificial respiration in the mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, but... And he shrugs. May thinks of the dark-skinned man putting his mouth on Mary's, Frenching her, sort of, breathing down her throat, right next to the wire cylinder full of plastic kickballs. Then, his, then he kneels down. Mary, he says. Mary! Like trying to wake her up after a hard night. She doesn't appear to be breathing, but you can't always tell. He puts his ears by her mouth and hears nothing. He feels air moving on his skin, but that's probably just the air conditioning. This gentleman called 911, the fat woman says. He's holding a, bu a bag of bugles. Mary, Ray says, louder this time, but he can't quit, quite bring himself to shout. Not down on his knees with people standing around, one of them a dark-skinned man. He looked up and says apologetically, 
she, she never gets sick. She's healthy as a horse. You never know, the old man says. He shakes his head. She just fell down, said the young woman in the blue smock. Didn't say a word. Didn't she grab her chest? Asked the fat woman with the bugles. I don't know, the young woman says. I guess not. Not that I saw. She just fell down. There's a rack of souvenir t-shirts near to kickballs. They say things like, my parents were treated like royalty in Castle Rock, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Mr. Gosh takes one and says, would you like me to cover her face, sir? God, no, Ray startled. She may only be unconscious. We're not doctors. Past Mr. Gosh, he sees three kids, teenagers, looking in the window. One of them is taking pictures with his cell phone. Mr. Gosh looks where Ray, Ray's looking and rushes at the door, flapping his hands. You kids get out of here. You kids get out. Laughing, the teenagers shuffle backwards and turn and jog past the gas pumps to the sidewalk. Beyond them, the nearly deserted downtown shimmers. A car goes by, pulsing rap. To Ray, the bass sounds like Mary's stolen heartbeat. Where's the ambulance, the old man says. How come it ain't here yet? Ray kneels by his wife while the time goes by. His back hurts and his knee hurts, but if he gets up, he'll look like a spectator. The ambulance turns out to be a Chevy Suburban, painted white with orange stripes. The, the red jackpot lights are flashing. Castle County Rescue is printed across the front, only backwards, so you can read it in your rearview mirror. Ray thinks that's pretty clever. The two men came in, are dressed in white. They look like waiters. One pushed an oxygen tank on a dolly. It's a green tank with an American flag decal on it. Sorry, this one says. Just cleared a car accident over in Oxford. The other one sees Mary lying on the floor, legs spread, hands to her side. Oh, gee, he says. Ray can't believe it. Is she still alive? He asks. Is she just unconscious? If she is, you better give her oxygen or she may have brain damage. Mr. Goss shakes his head. The young woman in the blue smock starts to cry. Ray runs to ask her what she's crying about, then knows. She has made up a whole story about him from what he just said. Why, if he can't come back in a week or so and play his cards right, she might toss him a mercy fuck. Not that he would, but he sees that maybe he could if he wanted to. Mary's eyes don't react to penlight. One EMT listens to her non-existent heartbeat. The other takes her non-existent blood pressure. It goes on like that for a while. The teenagers come back with some of their friends, other people too. Ray guesses they're d drawn by the flashing red lights on top of the EMT Suburban, the way bugs are drawn to a porch light. Mr. Gosh runs at them, flapping his arms. They back away again. Then when Mr. Gosh returns, the circle around Mary and Ray, they came back and start looking in again. One of the EMT says to Ray, She was your wife? Right. Well, sir, I'm sorry to say that she is dead. W oh. Ray stands up, his knees crack. They, they, they told me she was, but I wasn't sure. Mother Mary of God bless her soul, says the fat lady with the bugles. She crosses herself. Mr. Gosh offers one of the EMTs the souvenir t-shirt to put over Mary's face, but the EMT shakes his head and goes outside. He tells the little crowd that there's nothing to see, as if anyone's going to believe a dead woman in the quick pick isn't interesting. The EMT pulls a gurney from the back of the rescue vehicle. He does it with a single quick flip of the wrist. The legs fold down all by themselves. The old man with the thinning hair holds the door open and the EMT pulls the rolling deathbed inside. Woo hot, the EMT says, wiping his forehead. You may want to turn away for this part, sir, the other one says, but Ray watches as they lift her onto the gurney. A sheet has been neatly folded down at the edge of the gurney. Now they pull it all the way up until it's over her face. Now Mary looks like a corpse. In a movie, they roar out into the heat. This time it's the fat woman with the bugles who holds the door for them. The crowd has retreated to the sidewalk. There must be three dozen standing in the unrelieved August sunshine. When Mary is stored, the EMT comes back. One is holding a clipboard. He asked Ray about 25 questions. Ray can answer all but one of them about her age. Then he remembers. She's three years younger to her and tells him 34. We're going to take her to St. Stevie's, the EMT with the clipboard says. You can follow us if you don't know where that is. I know, Ray says. What, what do you want to do, an autopsy? Cut her up? The girl in the blue smock gives a gasp. Mr. Shock Gosh puts his arms around her. Then she puts his face against his white shirt. Ray wonders if Mr. Gosh is fucking her. He hopes not. Not because Mr. Gosh is brown skin. Ray doesn't care about that, but because he's got to be twice her age. An older man can take advantage, especially when he's the boss. Well, that's not our decision, the EMT says, but probably not. She didn't die unattended. I'll say, the woman with the bugles interjects, and it's pretty clearly a heart attack. You could probably have her released to the mortuary almost immediately. Mortuary? An hour ago, they were in the car arguing. 
I don't have an mortuary, he says. Not a mortuary, a burial plot, nothing. Why the hell would I? She's 34. The two EMTs exchange a look. Mr. Burkett, there'll be someone there to help you with all that, sir. St. Stevie's. Don't worry about it. Don't worry? What the hell? The EMT wagon pulls off with the lights still flashing, but the siren off. The crowd on the sidewalk starts to break up. The counter girl, the old man, the fat woman, and Mr. Gosh look at Ray as though he's someone special or celebrity. She wanted a purple kickball for her niece, he says. She's having a birthday. She'll be eight. Her name is Tally. She was, she was named for an actress. Mr. Gosh takes a purple kickball from the wire rack and holds it out to Ray in both hands. On the house, he says. Thank you, sir, Ray says. The woman with the bugles burst into tears. Murray, mother of God, she says. They stand around for a while talking. Mr. Gosh gets sodas from the cooler. They are also on the house. They drink the sodas, and Ray tells them a few things about Mary, steering clear of the arguments. He tells them how she made a quilt that took third prize in the Castle County Fair. That was in 02, maybe 03. That's so sad, the woman with the bugle says. She had opened them and shared them around. They eat and drink. My wife went in her sleep, the old man in the thinning hair said. She, she just laid down on the sofa and never woke up. We were married 37 years. I always suspected I'd go first, but that's not the way God wanted it. I can still see her laying there on the sofa. He's shaking his head. I can't believe it. Finally, Ray runs out of the things to tell them, and they run out of things to tell him. Customers are coming in again. Mr. Gosh waits on some, and the woman in the blue smock waits on others. Then the fat woman says she really has to go. She gives Ray a kiss on the cheek before she does. You need to see your business, Mr. Burkett, she tells himself. Her tone is both reprimanding and flirtatious. Ray thinks she may be another mercy fuck, possibly. He looks at the clock over the counter. It's the kind with a beer advertisement on it. Almost two hours have gone by since Mary went sidling between the cars and the cinder block side of the quick pick. And for the first time, he thinks of biz. When he opens the door, heat rushes at him, and when he puts his hands on the steering wheel to lean in, he pulls it back with a cry. It's got to be 130 in here. Biz is dead on the back. His eyes are milky. His tongue is protruding from the side of his mouth. Ray can see the wink of his teeth. There are little bits of coconut caught in his whiskers. That shouldn't be funny, but it is. Not funny enough to laugh, but funny in a way that some fancy word can't be quite thought of. Biz, old buddy, he says. I'm sorry. I forgot all about you. Great sadness and amusement swept over him as he looked at the big Jack Russell. That anything so sad should still be funny is just a crying shame. Well, you're with her now, ain't you? He says. And this thought is so sad, yet so sweet, that he begins to cry. It's a hard storm. While he's crying at it, it comes to him that he now he can smoke all he wants, anywhere in the house. He can smoke right there at her dining room table. You're with her now, biz, old buddy, he says through his tears. His voice is clogged and thick. It's a relief to sound just right for the situation. Poor old Mary. Poor old Biz. Damn it all! Still crying and with the purple kickball tucked under his arm, he goes back into the quick pick. He tells Mr. Gosh he forgot to get cigarettes. He thinks maybe Mr. Gosh will give him a pack of premium harmonies on the house as well. But Mr. Gosh's generosity doesn't stretch that far. Ray smokes all the way to the hospital with the windows shut and Biz in the back seat and the air condition on high.